Hello, and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on a novel nutritional approach to rearing organic pasture broiler chickens by Michael Lilburn and Larry Phelan of The Ohio State University. This is your host, Alice Formiga, from the eOrganic Community of Practice at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org in the Organic Agriculture section. Before we start, I'd like to just give you a very quick rundown of today's program. The presentation will last between 45 and 60 minutes. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, at which time we'll have about 30 minutes for questions. So today, I'm very glad to welcome back Michael Lilburn, um, who presented a webinar about the same NIFA OREI project several years ago, um, which is archived on our website and on the YouTube channel, where we just discovered it's gotten over 5,000 views. And he is a professor at the unit and the unit supervisor of the Poultry Research Center in the Department of Animal Sciences at The Ohio State University. We also welcome Larry Phelan today, who is a professor in the Department of Entomology, also at Ohio State University. So with that, I'm going to hand over the screen controls to our first presenter, Michael Lilburn. Okay, thank you, Alice, and uh, I hope everybody's having a good afternoon, and if you saw Larry's picture in the previous slide, I think it's obvious which of the two of us has the right priorities. Um, this is part two of a, um, of, I gave a, an initial webinar um, two years ago. Um, this was part of a grant sp uh, sponsored by OREI um, in part of USDA. And so what I want to do is give a follow-up on our last two years worth of research. As a brief overview, um, our objective here is we had a, a rotation of three plots. Um, and again, our goal here was to, to try to adapt uh, our research to, to smaller producers in a traditional grazing type of uh, scenario. Um, our first plot was a clover poultry plot. Um, the clover was planted on a yearly basis, and um, the birds were put in, in um, usually in late June. Uh, they were started for three weeks in, in pens, fed a certified organic diet before they went out, uh, beginning at approximately um, three weeks of age. And again, off of the clover poultry plot, uh, hope, hopefully what we're trying to gain is uh, soil fertility from the combination of the clover and the, the poultry. Again, we can take off a first cutting of hay um, from the clover plot. Um, Again, from a cash flow standpoint, and also the, the revenue from processed birds. Second plot, we have naked oats. Uh, the reason we arrived at naked oats is because there is a considerable amount of research out of Europe relative to naked oats being a cereal grain in conventional um, types of organic uh, small farms in Europe uh, where they cannot grow. Um, wheat, where they cannot grow corn, there's an awful lot of wheat that's grown, other cereals. And so we thought naked oats are higher in protein, higher in some essential amino acids versus corn, so it would be a good choice. As you can see below as well, the naked oats could be a source of our feed for the subsequent year. It could be a source of straw as well as depending on your location. Um, you could be sold into the organic granola type of market. And then the spelt. Um, this spout we planted again um, out of interest from a baking group uh, here in the uh, north central part of Ohio. Uh, spout could also be a grain as well as being a source of straw once the grain is harvested. One of the big goals here is we have a number of producers in our area of Ohio that have certified organic farms that also raise pastured poultry. And in putting the grant together, uh, these cooperators one of the things that they told us was that they raise poultry every year, they raise broilers on their certified organic farm, but they sell them strictly as pasture-raised broilers. Uh, the cost of organic feed is so prohibitively expensive. Uh, they have an established clientele for the other organic products coming off their farm. And so one of our goals here was to try to introduce and generate some data on, on ways that people could possibly um, capture organic prices for their broilers, uh, but do it in such a way that they're not paying the uh, prohibitively high costs 
of strictly organic feeds that they're purchasing. One of the things I want to point out here, uh, following up on my last slide, and this was some work from Heather Burley and Paul Patterson at Penn State University, uh, 2014. And what I want to draw your attention to, this was an organic experiment that they conducted. But I want you to pay attention to the last column I have percent starter. And what I want to emphasize here is that the starter period, if you feed a typical type of phase feeding program for broilers, that the starter period in this way, which would be somewhere between 18 and 21 days, um, would only represent about 15% of the total feed consumed. And so again, getting into the, uh, the concept here that if we feed a, uh, a fairly high-priced commercial broiler starter type organic feed, uh, and then we get into some, uh, some novel different approaches at um, you know, the subsequent diets from three weeks on, that really 85% of our cost, which is 85% of our feed, is going to be consumed after the starter period. And so again, this just supports our concept that if we can come up with an alternative way of feeding birds from three weeks on, uh, it has a hope of reducing our overall cost. And again, a picture as we start getting into the data to remind us that when we start raising organic poultry, um, our emphasis here is on a quality product. Uh, many organic producers will be selling whole birds in farmers markets or uh, whole birds to restaurants uh, to be used as some type of uh, high quality end product. And so certainly uh, as we get into our data, what we were looking at um, at, the end at the end of all of our, our different uh, grows each year, uh, we processed the birds and we were looking at basically a carcass weight because for a lot of organic producers, the carcass weight is really what they're going to be selling. And so we were targeting our programs at trying to create a six or a six and a half pound live weight of which approximately 65% would be the carcass weight. So that was our goal. And again, with the eating ex experience of organic poultry being the end result of what we're looking for. So one of the paradigms we were testing here was that um, if you try to use organic ingredients um, to raise birds to their, to their maximal growth potential, so if you're using a, a commercial broiler or you're using a very popular type of, say, a red bro or a red range restraint on pasture, the, the protein and amino acid requirements for birds are, are very, very high and therefore organic ingredients to meet these requirements are very, very expensive. Our paradigm we were testing was that, again, from three weeks of age on, we wanted to make sure the birds were healthy, we wanted to make the birds sure the birds were growing well, uh, there were no health issues, there was good feathering. Um, at the end of the, the growing period, we wanted to have a really good quality carcass. But we didn't need necessarily to push these birds. Our intent here was not to have them growing maximally. Our intent was to have them growing adequately to obtain a good product at the end. And so you have, again, a diet that's very expensive, much higher in protein and amino acids, for instance, to get the birds to grow as fast as possible, versus an alternative diet in which the birds obtain an adequate body weight, but they, maybe they do it in a longer period of time. So that was what we were testing. And again, what was behind this is the fact that, particularly when we're using commercial broilers, um, and one of the things I want to emphasize today throughout my presentation is, um, while we're trying to target here, say, smaller organic type producers, um, our objective here at all times is to really talk about profitability. Um, even smaller organic farms, you still need to be profitable. And so one of the things that we will be testing, as you'll see the data, is uh, using commercial broilers as, as well as a popular pasture type bird called a red bro. Um, the reason for the commercial broilers is these birds, I think as everyone listening to this can attest, have been selected for body weight. Most of what contributes to their rapid body weight gain is their appetite. And as we started getting into some of the lower protein, lower amino acid levels in the diets that we were initially testing, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that these birds inherently have a pretty great appetite in what they've been selected for. Birds do not eat percent protein. Birds eat grams of protein, milligrams of amino acids. And certainly one of the things we were accounting for on was that our commercial broilers or feeding them 
by designing a lower protein, lower amino acid diet, could still make up for that with the appetite that they've been selected for and hence grow at a reasonable rate. So when we began this experiment, and again, this is from the, uh, the, the previous webinar, uh, we had done a lot of, uh, I'd done a lot of reading. Um, we'd come up with naked oats. There's quite a bit of data on naked oats. And as we began our experimentation, we got two samples of naked oats in Ohio. These were not organic. They were just simply naked oats that we were able to purchase in Ohio. You can see the crude protein, and you can see the, uh, the levels of amino acids in these two samples. And in the far column, I have number two corn. Again, just to emphasize the fact that the oats were quite a bit higher in protein. Uh, methionine levels were a little bit higher than in the corn, though not dramatically so. But our methionine plus cysteine, our two sulfur amino acids, um, when compared with corn, were about 50% higher in total sulfur amino acids. And again, lysine was about twice as high as it was in the corn. So again, um, by using a high level of naked oats here, as our predominant cereal grain, we could make up for some of the amino acid deficiencies inherent in corn. Now we ran through a series of preliminary experiments where we had different combinations of naked oats and our protein source was full fat soybean. Uh, many of you might be aware that full fat soybean is the same thing as roasted soybeans. And basically this is the soybean that is roasted and it's heat treated and but the fat has not been extracted or the oil has not been extracted. So it's approximately 35% protein, about 16% oil. Uh, the reason we chose the full fat soybeans as our source of protein was the fact that um, it is regionally available. One of the big challenges when you get into organic production is not necessarily identifying um, ingredients that are higher in protein or higher in amino acids, but identifying ingredients that are available. Uh, to local producers, and um, we found that full fat soy kind of met this met this requirement. Uh, it is widely available over over many parts of the U.S. Um, and again, a good source of protein, a good source of amino acids and oil. And the 75% naked oats, 20% um, full fat soybean diet was the one that, in our preliminary study, uh, gave us the best results. We went a little bit higher. 85% naked oats, 10% full fat soy. Uh, birds grew quite a bit slower than even we were trying to create a, a grower, slower growth rate, but they grew quite a bit slower. But also there was an excessive accumulation of carcass fat. So we arrived at this particular diet to use. And I want to point out here the level of crude protein, fat, lysine, and total sulfur amino acids um, in these initial diets that we used. And again, these are diets that were based on analysis. So moving forward in our first couple of years of experimentation, um, this was the, the diet that we were using and we were assuming as the nutrient content. As I'll show you in subsequent slides, um, we got very, very good performance. And upon analysis, what you'll, what you'll see is the fact that our diets, in fact, even though there were 75% naked oats, 20.6% full fat soy were considerably higher in protein and amino acids, which again emphasizes the importance of, of analyzing diets. So again, we used a commercial broiler, uh, white broiler to the left, and a, a very popular type broiler called a red bro, uh, significantly slower growing than, than the commercial white broilers. But again, we wanted to see how each of these strains would do in the uh, uh, in our experiment. Again, this is performance in 2012, and I, I showed these results in our, uh, our last webinar two years ago. Uh, so in our first experiment, the broiler attained a body weight of approximately 5.6 pounds. We were aiming for 6 pounds, but we had kind of predetermined when we were going to take these birds off of the pasture um, because we had to make arrangements with our, with our processor. So I thought that we would get to six pounds in approximately 53 or 54 days. We had to get them in at 51 days. And you can see we weren't too far off from six pounds. And you can see we also fashioned our experiment. We were going to wait for two weeks before we brought the red bros in because our previous experiment suggested that they would be about two weeks behind to the same body weight as the commercial broilers. And so what you can see is at 65 days here, 
two weeks older than the uh, broilers. Again, they're a little bit over six pounds. But ironically, both groups were right around four pound carcass weight. Um, so even though the broilers um, did not quite reach six pounds, you can see because of their increased carcass yield, and again, broilers have been selected for, for body weight yield and carcass yield, um, there, that 14 day difference still results in approximately the same carcass weight. So we were pretty happy here that our, 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 initial, our initial grow out results um, suggested that certainly this, this lower protein, lower amino acid diet could give us a very adequate carcass weight in the commercial broilers and a similar carcass weight with a little bit of a less percent carcass yield in the red bros 14 days later. So again, I talked about our preliminary experiment uh, when we chose the, the naked oats at 75%. Here is the analysis of the preliminary experiments. As I said, when we got into our field experiments, we started seeing a very, very good performance. And upon analysis of those diets, what you can see is the protein levels were considerably higher than in our preliminary experiment, again, with 75% naked oats. Our lysine levels significantly higher than our preliminary experiments, but particularly our methionine or methionine plus cysteine values were also considerably higher than in our preliminary experiments. And so what this suggested was the fact that while we had the same percentage of naked oats um, and full fat soybeans, that the naked oats were considerably higher in protein and amino acids. And in fact, about this time, again, this is from Heather Burley and Paul Patterson, um, they published a paper where they were looking at actually nine varieties of naked oats, and this would have been in Pennsylvania. And what you can see is their protein levels were considerably higher than the 12% that we had based our, our, our preliminary experiments on. And so certainly this suggested the fact that the naked oats that, that they had analysis on that we used in our experiments were in fact significantly higher in protein and amino acids. And we went back and did the analysis, and here I'm just showing you the crude pro proteins. Again, you can see part of this study, we did do a, a breed or a, a, uh, a yield comparison here on three varieties, and you can see that all three varieties gave us between 18 and almost 20% crude protein. And this would have been on a 90%, uh, this would have been an as-is basis. Um, this would not have been on a dry matter basis. So certainly this supported what we were seeing in our field diets, the fact that our protein levels were significantly higher than the original two Ohio oat varieties that we had tested. And so again, this shows the experimental diets from 2012 and 13. You can see we had 19.8% protein, much higher levels of lysine, total, methionine, total sulfur amino acids. And you can see in 2014 and 15, Again, the levels were very, very similar, a touch higher in lysine. But again, um, the naked oats that we were using um, were much higher in protein and amino acids. And, and so if this holds, if this really is true to the naked oats that may be available to us in the U.S. or regionally, uh, it further supports our hypothesis that they could be a, a very, very uh, superior grain uh, to be used as a, as a primary ingredient in, in, in growing broiler diets. Uh, we're still at 75 percent here naked oats and so certainly um, if we had to reformulate and do these experiments over again uh, we could quite possibly go even higher in naked oats and not seeing the same deleterious effects that we saw when we went to 85 percent in those preliminary experiments. Uh, so certainly naked oats as the prime ingredient in these diets uh, gives us very good performance. So I just want to show you some 2014-2015 uh, field results. Um, R1, R3, R2, and R4 simply represent the four rows that we had in our experimental plots. We had a total of eight rows. Um, as Larry will show you in his part of the presentation, we had a control row that had no poultry that was planted in clover. And then we randomly chose uh, the remaining four plots, uh, which ones would have the red bros, which ones would have the broilers. So again, the red bros are on top. You can see 14 days older, 2014. Now what I have here is 
What's really important is that if you're raising birds on pasture, that oftentimes all of the birds within a tractor have to go to the market at the same time. So how, how I've chosen to represent the data here is that we had two tractors, 25 birds in each tractor. And again, you can see that in the two tractors we had, we had a carcass weight of 3.9 to 5.46 pounds from the one tractor, 3.9 to 5.40 pounds in the second tractor. And this would represent 18 birds in each of these tractors. So essentially 72% of our birds are Red Rangers at 67 days were within this carcass weight of approximately four to five and a half pounds. You are going to get some spread, but I wanted to just show you the type of carcass weight range that we had in the Red Rangers, or in the Red Bros, excuse me. 14 days younger, the commercial broilers, and again, at 53 days, we're seeing considerably heavier birds than what we had seen in 2012. And again, what this shows you is that um, to gain approximately 78% coverage, we had 20 birds out of 25 that were four and a half to six pounds in carcass weight. And we had 19 birds out of 25 that were 4.6 to 6.4 pounds. So again, what this emphasizes is about 40 birds out of our 50 birds are in a very, very nice market weight range here as far as selling whole birds at 53 days. And so it emphasizes that from a profitability standpoint with the commercial broilers, you're getting to an acceptable body weight and actually a tighter body weight range here at 53 days than what you had in the red bros. So it's 14 days less to take these birds to market with a little bit better coverage in terms of tightening up the variability um, in the broilers. In 2014, three years of the experiment, okay, in three years we had three cooperator farms. Essentially these are certified organic farms um, in, the, in the greater Wayne County area. Um, and these are farms that grow pasture-raised birds. We paid for the birds to be processed. We gave them the birds. We took down feed for them. Basically, they just had to raise the birds. Similar sized tractors to what we had. And I just wanted to show you that in 2014, just looking at the red bros, in 68 days, again, we had a little bit of variability here between, between uh, cooperators. But what you can see is that you actually take these birds out to a producer's farm versus a controlled organic situation like we had at OARDC, again, at 68 days, you're getting approximately an average here of 4.3 to 4.6 or a 4.5 average carcass weight on the cooperator farms. So it gives you an idea here that, um, you know, with the slower growing birds, they're getting a fairly similar response to what we were seeing at our test farm. So 2015, so what I want to show you here is we are very interested in some carcass comparisons between our, our two lines. And obviously we have very, very different ages at which we're processing the birds. And so within each of these ages then we went in and we took birds within three comparative body weight ranges corresponding to light, medium, and heavyweight birds. You can see 6.1. These birds are 5.9. It was about as close as we could get. We're still having 14 or 15 or 16 birds, the medium, and then the heavy. And so again, if you look at the carcass weights, it just gives you an idea that within the red bros, again, they're a little bit, they're quite a bit older, but within the same body weight range, we're getting approximately the same carcass weight. You can look over here and you can see that it's about 67, 68% carcass weight. Our broilers are a touch heavier in carcass weight. We're not getting nearly the, the differentiation here or the difference between the strains in carcass weight as we saw in that very preliminary experiment where we had about 5%. Um, so again, on a total carcass weight basis, we're seeing about the same percentage. Now within each of these ranges, within each of the birds in each of these ranges, we went in and we collected total dark meat. So this represents the dark meat from both thighs and both drums. 
versus one half of the breast, and this would represent the two major breast muscles, the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. The thing I want to point out here is, again, you're getting considerably more breast meat from the commercial broilers at each of the body weights than you are in the red bros. So again, you're getting talking about that eating experience. We're slowing the broilers down here by feeding these organic diets, lower in protein, lower in amino acids. We're certainly slowing them down. But at an equivalent carcass weight, what you can see is you're still getting significantly more carcass protein being deposited, which again is not surprising. But getting, again, emphasizing my point, if you're thinking about from a total carcass standpoint, uh, from a total carcass protein standpoint, you're getting much more carcass protein and increase in breast muscle size in particular uh, in the commercial broilers versus the red bros. Now the last part of the experiment I want to talk about here is that um, we had some extra whole spelt uh, left over at the end of the, the one year. And actually Larry, who's done a lot of work with the, the baking industry, was very interested in potential of spelt as a feed ingredient. And, um, and there has been some work done. But again, here, I'm thinking in terms of, throughout this experiment, I'm thinking in terms of what can we do to make, make production and make all of the experiment something that is really easy for a small producer. And one of the things that we were looking at was what if we fed the cereal grain that we're harvesting on our farm that we can buy, if we fed it as a whole grain. So what we have here is, is try to follow here the, um, my explanation in terms of how these diets are set up. What you can see is we have a 75% cereal in these experiments. This is not a naked oats experiment. 75% cereal. And then we had our 20.6% full fat soy. So of that 75% cereal, we had 100% of the cereal as ground wheat. We had 100% of that cereal as either whole wheat or ground wheat. 100% of that cereal as whole wheat unground or 75% of that cereal as whole spelt. So again, seeing whether we could get adequate growth on these birds from three weeks of age onward simply by feeding the whole grain as the grain portion of our diet. And again, these birds, we started this experiment at three weeks of age. The reason we started at three weeks of age is because I was a little concerned with the birds' actual abilities to handle whole grains before this age. So we had approximately the same weight at three weeks, and then we fed each of these diets. The thing I want to point out here is you can see that by seven weeks of age, and these were all with commercial broilers. There were no red bros here. These are commercial broilers. So by seven weeks, we're getting a little bit over four pounds body weight in each of our treatments. By nine weeks, you can see that the birds giving us the, the poorest performance were those who were fed a traditional ground wheat, full fat soybean diet. Each of our whole grain treatments, in this case it was 50-50, but each of our treatments that had at least 50% or in this case 100% of the whole grain, these birds grew very, very well. Okay, and so we got, accept we got very, very good growth on these birds. And again, this is the carcass weight you can see in the farthest column. And again, about over a 70% carcass yield. And so this certainly suggests to us that if we're looking at an economical way of feeding birds on a farm, we have access to a whole grain cereal we either produce ourselves or we can purchase, um, that possibly one way of decreasing some of our feed costs is adopting a whole grain feeding strategy. Now the one thing I want to point out here, if you're not familiar with poultry, and when you mix a diet together, this Again, 75 and 20, this is 95% of the diet. The other 5% is made up of limestone, dicalcium phosphates, trace minerals, and vitamins. Each of these three ingredients have a very, very different density than our full-fat soybeans or our cereal grain. And certainly when you're feeding a whole grain as a cereal, very, very different density. One of my concerns was getting what we call feed separation. So if you're putting out for instance, in a tube feeder, if you're putting out 20 pounds or so of feed, 
it's very possible over a few day period of time to have the limestone and the dicalcium phosphate and the vitamins separating out from your, your whole cereal and your soybean meal. So we fed prescribed amount of feed each day so the bird would clean up the feed each day to avoid this separation. But the point here is our hypothesis with the birds could do very, very, very well on whole grain diets, uh, on ground diets, and in fact they did. Um, and so we're very pleased with this. So with that, I will now turn over to Larry for, the, um, for some of the agronomic uh, analysis that he did in our experiment. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, I just wanted to uh, talk to, for a few minutes about uh, uh, some of the field aspects of, of this project. Uh, this project was designed as a systems uh, project where we're interested in whether chickens could be incorporated into a organic rotation. And so this is a plot map showing <coughs> how we rotated the crops uh, uh, across the three years. So we had three fields here uh, that each year would have uh, represented one uh, year of the uh, rotation. So the, the question that we had was not only uh, how well could we produce birds here, but how could the birds actually benefit or what impact did the birds have on this uh, whole system? Uh, as Mike had indicated before, I think in one of the slides he showed, uh, when the birds are on the uh, ground or on a, uh, an area of the ground, uh, they really decimate uh, the vegetation in that area. So here you can see kind of the trail of destruction, if you will, uh, behind these cages uh, compared to the lanes uh, just beside them. These cages were uh, moved uh, once per day. And as you can see, here's a close-up here of the edge of the lanes where there were no birds. So we had a very high clover here. And then where there were birds, it was basically bare ground uh, right after the, the birds left. This, of course, was due to the, the very high uh, uric acid uh, content of the, uh, the manure from the birds, uh, which had a, a very phytotoxic effect. Now, after a period of time, the pasture does recover, uh, but one of the things that we found interesting in this case was the way in which it recovered uh, was gave us a plant community that was not the same as what was there before the birds um, um, uh, were feeding uh, or were caged on that area. So here you can maybe see, based uh, depending on the resolution of your monitors, uh, you can see the line between, to the left here, would be a lane where there was birds, and then over here there were no birds. One of the things that we really noticed was a big increase in the amount of foxtail, which you can see here, uh, is flowering at this point uh, in the year, which would have been uh, late in the year. Uh, so we thought we should uh, document this to as part of our recommendations of how to uh, manage these birds on the, on the, uh, in the uh, uh, pasture. And so we, we took some plant censuses at different distances away from the cages. So here you see on the x-axis we have, I have these labeled as days. Uh, in fact, all this data was collected on the same day but we were collecting at different distances behind the cages. So in other words, uh, here the red line represents the lane that had the birds in. So in this lane, we would have uh, collected uh, all the plant matter that was, uh, I believe it was uh, 40 feet behind the cage. So that would have been two days prior and then et cetera as we go across here. So in the control then, what you see here, we're looking at the amount of clover dry weight at these different locations. And so you can see there's some, some variation, but this variation doesn't represent a temporal uh, change, but rather variation across the field, all right? But the main point is that we want to make comparisons uh, at each distance because these would have been 
really just beside each other uh, in the field. So this would have represented the uh, control for that variation in the field. And you can see that where there were birds uh, at all the time points or at the, all the distances, uh, we saw a big uh, reduction in the amount of clover that was present. So even 26 days after the birds were present, there was really no recovery of, uh, of the clover. Now you compare that uh, coming over here when we look at uh, weedy grasses, we separated out the weedy grasses from uh, pasture grasses, uh, but the weedy grasses we see a very different picture. So here in the controls you can see that the amount of weedy grasses uh, range from about 20 to 40 uh, grams per square meter dry weight, but where there were birds we saw a very dramatic increase in the amount of uh, weedy grass biomass. And again, as I indicated in that picture there, uh, most of this ended up being uh, various species of foxtail that seemed to be most responsive to this uh, uric acid input from the birds. Uh, down here we see the effect on uh, broadleaf weeds. Now these kind of bounce around a lot and that's mainly because the amount of broadleaf weeds we had in this field, this is an organic field, uh, was relatively small. So uh, not a big change, but uh, the same sort of pattern. So that uh, 26 days after the birds, uh, again, we see a, a big increase in terms of the uh, amount of broadleaf weeds. So if you put these two together then, the weedy grasses and the broadleaf weeds, uh, you see this uh, sort of pattern where 26 days later, 18 to 26 days later, we're seeing that uh, the weeds are growing uh, uh, much better uh, than the clover. Now I would say too that uh, I don't have it graphed here, uh, but when we looked at total biomass, so we looked at clover, we looked at pasture grasses, weedy grasses, and broadleafs, uh, there was also a increase in the total uh, vegetation biomass of about 60 percent, so it was about 60 percent higher uh, in the uh, lanes with, with the birds. This is looking at it then uh, in those later dates, the 18 and 26 days, uh, looking at it uh, in terms of the composition. So for our controls where there were no chickens present, you can see that the clover represented about 40 percent uh, of the total biomass, the non-weedy grasses represent about 35 percent, 34 percent. Uh, broad leaves were about 12 percent. Uh, weedy grasses about 17 percent. But where the chickens were present, now you see, you can see how dramatic the shift was in terms of the composition. So now clover only represents about 14 percent of the total biomass, whereas the weedy grasses has doubled to about 35 percent of, of the total. Non-weed uh, grasses uh, stays about the same or maybe goes up a little bit and the broadleaf weeds in terms of overall composition uh, stays, uh, stays about the same. Now as a result of these uh, findings, uh, the following year, this, all this data came from our uh, 2013 uh, season. Uh, the following year we decided to change the rate at which the pens were moved and so um, Mike and uh, uh, company uh, started moving these cages twice a day in order to reduce this effect. And we did not collect data unfortunately that year but uh, visually you could see uh, a big improvement so that we did not, uh, at least visually, you could not see a difference uh, in the community, plant community composition between the control lanes and the chicken lanes. But just to make sure this is uh, what we were seeing was, <coughs> was uh, accurate, uh, the following year, so this past year, we repeated the situation of 2013 and, and left the cages on there uh, for a full day. Now here we are looking at it again uh, at different distances away from the cages that would represent seven days after the cages, or excuse me, uh, oops, 
seven days after the birds were present, 14 days after they were present, and 21 days. Uh, here you can see that in our controls, uh, there was not much variation uh, in terms of the composition. So we had 75% uh, clover, 80% clover, and about 85% clover uh, in our controls. And the grass, uh, grasses, this would have represented both weedy and non-weedy grasses, uh, represented a relatively small percentage. However, once again, where there were birds present, now the grasses take over so that now clover represents only a very small fraction uh, of that plant community and grasses are dominating by far. So the, the point that we want to make here is this is just a, a practical, uh, practical measure uh, that uh, when, you're, when you put your birds out, you want to consider what impact they're having on that, uh, that pasture community and how they might be uh, uh, affecting the amount of weeds that you would have in subsequent years. Um, there, it's not all negative in the sense that even though these are weedy grasses, <clears throat> the, having some plant biomass out there means that the, the plants are taking up more of the nitrogen that the birds are producing so that uh, it's not being leached out or not, being, not evaporating. Uh, as much, uh, but is being uh, taken up in weed form, unfortunately, uh, but that when it's plowed down then becomes available in terms of uh, breakdown and uh, uh, availability of nitrogen for the following crop. So I want to stop there and uh, I guess we'll open the floor up for, uh, for questions. Alice? Thank you. Um, in case you just joined us or re didn't miss the beginning, I just wanted to um, let you know that if you have questions for the speakers, you can just type them into the question box. And um, we have plenty of time for questions. And I also just wanted to um, remind everyone that we have been recording this talk. So if you didn't come right at the beginning, um, you'll be able to watch the recording in approximately two weeks or so yeah. on the eOrganic YouTube channel as well as on e-extension in our webinar archives. If you just Google webinars by eOrganic, you'll find all of our webinars, including the previous webinar um, by Michael. Um, so um, yeah, if you want to check that out, um, you're welcome to do that. Um, so let's just move on. We do have a few questions coming in. And um, don't be shy, because um, we don't have that many questions coming in. So chances are, if uh, you do ask a question, we'll have time to answer it. So um, this is a question just about that last um, bit that Larry was talking about, about the weeds. Um, do you think that foxtail seed was introduced through the poultry ration or just released from the seed bank? Uh, I think it was uh, released from the, the seed bank. Um, uh, Mike can maybe address this better, but uh, uh, you know, from the, from the seed that we looked at, there. Uh, we did not have much weed in there, so uh, uh, particularly in the ground um, feed, uh, there really would have been a relatively small amount of, of, of weed there. I, I think it just represented a, a response to nitrogen uh, of the weeds that were present. You know, weeds in general tend to be very, uh, uh, very responsive to, to nitrogen inputs, and so uh, I think that's what, uh, what we're seeing reflected here. Okay, and um, I guess I'll just keep asking a couple questions about that part, and then we'll move back on to uh, Mike's section. Um, would the effect on clover be seen with other legumes as well? Uh, I, I suspect so. Um, uric acid is highly phytotoxic, so you're going to really kill down uh, most of uh, really any plants that are present there. and. Where uh, legumes in, in general, of course, don't need much nitrogen uh, since they produce their own through symbiotic relationships with microbes. Uh, so I think having high nitrogen levels there uh, favors uh, plants that that uh, need nitrogen, and so it, it shifts the uh, uh, basically the niche in favor of uh, of the weed community. Okay, um, and what do you think of the, the impact of the birds in reducing the clover would have on reducing the needed fertility from the clover rotation? 
Well, that's, uh, that uh, is a great question and uh, one that we had hoped to answer, but uh, uh, for, for various reasons uh, weren't really able to, to do. Uh, visually, all we can say is the, the next year you could see differences. Uh, the next crop was spelt after the birds, and you visually could see differences in the height of the plant. Uh, but uh, because of some technical issues, uh, we did not, we were not able to measure yields. But okay. uh, like I say, just visually, it looked like there there was a benefit. Okay. Yeah. Somebody wanted to know whether you were able to uh, measure or research the soil fertility afterward. Yeah. The the, the issue was that um, we haven't done that because the uh, the manager uh, without me knowing, uh, laid down a, a high amount of, uh, uh, of compost, which have, would have swamped uh, the effects of the birds, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, we're getting quite a few questions now, so I'm just going to kind of go down the line here. Um, how much, oh, this is going back to Mike's presentation, um, I think talking about the re results from 2014 or 15 or so, um, how much of the grain mix was fed and what was the feed efficiency? Um, well, we measured feed efficiency from three weeks of age when the birds went out to the end of the study. And so the feed efficiency values are going to be higher than what most people are used to seeing only because they were in their older ages. But we saw um, a feed efficiency of approximately 2.2 for the broilers. Um, for that uh, 28, for that 21 to uh, early 50-day period and about 2.5 to 2.7 and I'm averaging here over over a couple of years 2.5 to 2.7 for the um, for the red bros so there was a considerable difference in uh, in feed efficiency um, and a lot of it was just the combination of slow growth and, and older birds as any bird ages uh, it becomes less efficient and so uh, some of those differences are just having to rear the red bros for two extra weeks. Okay. Um, here we have somebody who wants to know whether we could expect the same results from hulled oats versus naked oats. Um, I, I think the, uh, the concept behind the naked oats is simply that, um, you know, they thresh relatively clean. Um, and, and the hulled oats... Um, you know, I think that if you had hulled oats, you, you, could get, you could get good results, probably similar results, um, depending on the protein and the amino acid makeup. But again, the, uh, the naked oats from a small producer standpoint um, don't need a degree of threshing. And, so, and that's what most of the work in Europe has been with. And so that's why we decided to go with the naked oats. Um, the other, and this question's been asked at a couple of farm days. Um, the other thing is of our three varieties, we use the streaker variety um, is what we use as our, our source of naked oats for our poultry diets. The buff variety that we, we used was prone to lodging when we did our variety trial. And that was a, a fairly common observation by a number of people at our field days is that naked oats are much more prone to lodging than conventional oats are which has nothing to do with them as an ingredient, but certainly is a practical concern if someone is thinking in terms of using oats as, a, as a, an ingredient in their diets. Okay, yeah, and lodging, just because we always get this question, is when the, um, the grain plants fall over. So, um, yeah, every time we get that question, so I just want to answer it. Um, so, um, any sense um, what proportion of the feed utilized by the broilers in the experiment came from earthworms or insects? Um, yeah, you know, that's another common question that we have. Um, I'm not going to, I'm sorry, I heard the insects and what was the other part of the question, Alice? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let's Earthworms. see. Earthworms. Earthworms or insects, earthworms. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that there was much consumption of earthworms at all, only in the sense of, you know, moving the, um, moving the tractors each day. Um, I, I really can't quantify the insect the insects per se, but um, I, I'm, as a person and as someone that has done quite a bit of work with birds outside, 
Um, certainly, earth, you know, certainly insects can can comprise a portion of a bird's diet, but I'm not a big believer that they can really comprise a major portion of the diet for birds on pasture. So um, certainly, I think there may have been a little bit of some insect intake, but I don't really think the response at all was to uh, was to insects or earthworms. Uh, nor do I think there was a major response to um, to the actual pasture itself, other than uh, you know possibly some pigmentation from the from the clover per se. Um, but I think it was mostly from the responses were were from the diets, and I would say in my mind, 90 95 percent of our response was a diet response. Okay. Um, would there be any problems on a crude protein or excess nitrogen or sulfur amino acid balance when going from a 75 to 25 ration to the 85-15 balance with the new varieties of naked oats? Well, that's what I was alluding to a little bit. I think that given that our protein levels in the naked oats and our amino acid levels are higher, um, if I was to start afresh right now, uh, certainly, I don't think we would see the negative responses or as negative a response to the 85% naked oats inclusion because the levels of, of protein and amino acids um, would have been very, very similar, I think, to the, to the original diets that we got optimal performance on 75% naked oats. So, again, that emphasizes the importance of analysis. Um, we did our analysis before the fact. And each year we manufactured our diets, um, but again, these these experiments were not designed to formulate to a constant protein amino acid level. It was seeing whether a high rate of inclusion could give us adequate growth, albeit slower growth and good carcass quality. Um, but knowing what we know now, I certainly think we could go five or ten percent higher in the naked oats and, and still see a good growth response. Okay. Um, have you done any research with other pasture-raised poultry, for example, heritage and commercial um, fast-growing turkeys? Uh, we have not done anything with, with other heritage strain birds or turkeys. We've simply, um, you know, the experiments that are reported here. Um, turkeys, uh, I think turkeys could be, would show a similar response uh, turkeys need actually obviously a much much longer growing period and um, you know it's just a whole an entirely different uh, set of experimental constraints um, a couple of people have asked me at a couple of the field days about heritage strain birds um, the red bros that we used obviously grew much slower than commercial broilers uh, but they still grow faster than um, many of the heritage strain birds that are out there that people will be using. And so my, my feeling is that um, you could probably get adequate growth, you could probably get the same carcass weights at the same body weights, but with heritage strain birds you'd have to go probably another two to four weeks depending upon the strain um, to do that. And so, but that's something we have not tested or looked at. Okay. Um, were the birds allowed um, a two foot by two foot space within the size of the tractor? For example, a nine by twelve tractor with twenty seven birds. That very good question. These were actually five by ten foot tractors, uh, fifty square feet. We had twenty five birds in each, which is a the minimum for um, for the organic standard. Um, if you actually take the um, the area occupied by the feeder, um, they probably had a touch under a two square feet, but uh, but each tractor did allow for two square feet. What didn't come through in the picture was we actually had for waterers, we actually had five gallon buckets with um, with nipple waterers on the bottom, and so the the five gallon buckets with the nipple waterers uh, were you know, a good uh, foot and a half off the ground. And so I didn't consider that to be wasted space. The birds would still walk under the waters. Okay. Um, visually, was spelt better in the poultry lanes or the non-poultry lanes? Oh. Uh, visually, uh, it was better in the poultry lanes. <clears throat> 
but again, that's just visually. We didn't, uh, we were not able to uh, to calculate yield data on these, but uh, that's that was our impression. Okay. Um, what might you recommend as a high protein substitute for soy? Oh, that's a question I get very, very often, and it's a it's it, it's a problematic question, and, and a problematic is from from two different directions. Um, one is the availability question. You'll often hear people will talk about using fish meal, three or four percent fish meal, as a high protein alternative to soybean meal. The problem is that fish meal is not readily available and it's incredibly expensive. Um, and organic, organic, or fish meal is often touted to be used in organic diets because it's approved by OMRI. But again, fish meal is not widely available. Um, I, I wish I had a, a really good answer because the other thing that happens is when you start getting to other sources of high protein ingredients, then you also get into what is GMO versus non-GMO, which is a whole different series of problems when it comes to availability. So um, I would say strictly from the protein side, what I've recommended to people is, is cottonseed meal. But again, um, sourcing non-GMO cottonseed is very difficult. People have, uh, have used uh, field peas. And I think field peas um, are somewhat available. Um, the problem with field peas is that people often have to go to 40% plus field peas to get adequate protein in the diet. And you get into some, some, some dietary effects when you have to go that high in field peas. So um, I, I don't have a single answer. Um, if you want to use something other than soy, you probably will have to mix maybe some different sources of protein, but the real problem, as I said, gets into sourcing non-GMO protein sources. I don't really have an answer. Um, if GMO is not a constraint, the other thing that I would recommend to people is canola. Canola meal is a, is a very, very good source of protein, um, and, and that may be uh, another alternative, but again, you get into the, the continual GMO versus non-GMO questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we were talking. You were saying that the um, they were moved twice a day. So, um, what time of day was the second move made? Uh, the guys on our research farm usually moved them about eight o'clock in the morning, and um, I would go out between two, approximately one to two o'clock in the afternoon to move them the second time. Okay. And, and the sun went and the sun went down at approximately seven o'clock over our growing season. Obviously, that varied. Just to try to give you a feel for when they were moved a second time relative to when it was dark, and really the birds are very very quiet when it's dark. Not a lot of eating or either. Okay. Um, is there any effect of the diet on the quality of the meat, and what would be what if, what was the difference between the pastured broilers and the commercial broilers um, in terms of meat quality? Um, in the first webinar, I presented some. We actually the first two years of the grant, we actually t broke our birds down into body weight classes similar to what I reported today. And then we cut the carcasses in half, and then we actually cooked the carcasses to um, 160 degrees and, um, and basically measured loss. Um, and we lost approximately 30% or, or our cooking loss was approximately 30% in, um, in both strains. Um, the one thing that we, we did find is the fact that the red bros uh, were considerably fatter than were the commercial broilers at the same body weight. And I think part of this was the, the age effect. So we certainly did see more carcass fat in, in the red bros. Now realize that when you take a, 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 a poultry carcass, an awful lot of the fat in the carcass you're removing during processing. So a lot of the abdominal fat and, and some of the, the other fat depots are actually being removed. When we took that carcass and actually cut the carcass in half, one half the carcass we ground, we measured dry matter, we measured protein, the other half the carcass we cooked, 
and, and certainly the dry matter content and the fat content in the red bros was considerably higher. But overall cooking losses was not that different between the broilers and the red bros. So that's, that's not really an organoleptic thing. Um, the other thing I want to mention here were two slides that I did not include in the presentation for an in interest of time. We also did a fatty acid analysis on abdominal fat from the birds that were out on pasture versus the birds. We kept another group of birds inside without access to pasture. We also looked at fatty acid analysis on those. And certainly there was no benefit of being on the clover or on pasture in terms of the enhancing omega-3 content. And in fact, if you actually look at the ratio of omega-6s to omega-3s, um, we did not have a very, very uh, optimal ratio. And basically, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of, of anything less than 10 um, would be pretty good for poultry. Um, and our ratios with the naked oats and both inside and out, our ratios are 12 or 13 which in retrospect makes complete sense because we had a lot of soybean oil coming into our diet from the full fat soybeans but also the the fatty acid profile in naked oats is one in which it's very high in linoleic acid very similar to corn and so really the the naked oats and the full fat soy are giving these birds a really really high intake of omega-6s and a very very low intake of omega-3s um, so if you want to include that in the organoleptic component of it, um, we weren't necessarily beneficially affecting the omega-6, omega-3 ratios. Okay, um, moving back to Larry here. If the pasture already contained desirable grasses, such as orchard grass or bluegrass, do you think these would be then enhanced by the poultry? Let's see. Sorry, I couldn't find the button there. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Yes, uh, we we did see uh, that the <clears throat> the uh, beneficial grasses, the orchard grasses, and the uh, uh, pasture grasses did increase uh, slightly. Uh, so uh, there was a benefit to them, but uh, the overwhelming effect was the the weedy grasses. They're, they increased at a at a greater rate than did the um, uh, the beneficial grasses. Okay. Um, and then, let's see, how much did the clover pasture contribute to the diet of the birds? Um, I think, yeah, I, I alluded to that in a, in a, in a previous answer I gave. Um, I, I, don't th I don't think the pasture itself contributes a significant amount of what I call the core nutrients uh, to birds. By core nutrients, I'm talking about energy and protein. Um, I think most of what pasture contributes are some of the, the micronutrients, uh, certainly anybody familiar with pasture-raised birds and eggs from pasture-raised birds. Uh, the yolks are quite a bit more yellow because of some of the, the carotenoids that are present in grasses and, and would be in clover. Um, and what I allude to is the fact that, you know, any, any type of grass or pasture is going to be about 85 or 90 percent water. So certainly from a macronutrient standpoint, um, there's not going to be a, a significant contribution to the, the, to the protein and energy needs. Um, and really we, um, we didn't quantify um, you know, what, what some of the micronutrients, what, what effects a micronutrient intake would have had. Uh, I suspect that um, if we had actually done a, uh, a pigmentation measurements on the, on, on the carcass itself, we might have seen enhanced pigmentation in the birds on the pasture. Uh, but that really would have been the only effect that I would have expected. Okay, um, here's a comment. Um, I've noticed that when I have mother hens raise chicks that there's no need for chick starter. The hens will crack any whole grains or large seeds though I do see from just a few days of age the hens dig up earthworms and the bugs which the chicks can consume easily as long as, as if they are not, as long as they are. I, I can't quite read that. From what I observe, chicken prefer to have a large portions of their diet be worms, bugs, and mice rather than grains. 
So do you want to comment? Yeah, I no, I don't really uh, I don't really have a comment. I get a little bit concerned about the mice part. Did they mean that the mice have access to the grains as well? And I'm not being facetious here, or that did I hear mice correctly? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, I think a lot of it. A lot of it depends, Alice. It's certainly um, depending what I call your metric is. If you're looking at at, at hens that will that will hatch chicks, um, which suggests a, a backyard type of scenario, um, I think the chicks can do very very well on on kind of like what's left over, maybe some of the scratch grains that the hen's providing. Um, but again, the objective there for the chicks is to kind of, you know, make it through those first few days and then maybe have access to grain on their own. But those birds really aren't growing at the same rate that, say, uh, conventional poultry or even like the red bros would be. So it, it's a bit of an apples and oranges comparison in terms of of that scenario with what we were trying to look at. But but certainly I I, I firmly believe that the, that the chicks can be very very thrifty. Um, just being around the hen without access to a starter diet, but I would still get back to I'm not sure how much of that would come from worms and things, but but I don't know. Okay, yeah, I the don't. person who submitted that comment said that um, he's found that chickens will hunt down field mice in pasture. Kind of interesting. Uh, well, I, I I'm not going to deny that, but that wouldn't be the chicks. <laughs> okay. That would be the adult birds. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, in the whole grain trials. Were the um, were the soybeans fed whole or ground? The soybeans, and again, these would be extruded soybeans. Uh, all soybeans fed to poultry need to be heat treated. Um, conventional soybean meal, the heat treating is during the process of extracting the soybean oil out in the production of, of the actual oil itself. What you're left with is an oil extracted product. That's why the protein level is higher. For full fat soybeans or roasted beans, most of them are put through an extruder in which they're forced through a small, small dye. Um, the heat that's needed to destroy the anti-nutritional factors in raw soybeans, uh, the heat is adequate through extrusion. And so these would really be extruded soybeans um, or then put through an extruder and heat treated. And so um, they would be in a, a large particle size Certainly not small particle like soybean meal, but a um, you know a large particle size soybean meal. Okay, um, let's see. Um, this question says it seemed like the 725 birds were too small for the market at the end. Is that right? Um, and if so, would putting fewer birds in the tractor be a good idea? 725. Mm -hmm. Or 7 25. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure which slide they're talking about, but uh, there's no doubt that having uh, fewer birds in a tractor um, would have, you know, would have given the birds more space and, and could have facilitated feed intake to a greater extent. So, um, again, we were using the two square feet. I'm not pretending that that's an optimal square footage. Um, it was just you know, what the, the organic NOSB recommends, and so that's what we use. Um, I think that certainly if pasture preservation is one of your goals, where you want to keep it in, 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 good, in good shape after the birds are on it, then certainly fewer birds would be a way of accomplishing that for all the reasons that Larry discussed. Okay. Now, Mike, uh, to follow up on that, uh, there was still food left over uh, each day, right? So... Oh yeah, these birds. These birds were ad libitum fed, so I mean there was no um, no competition for the food. No, no. But um, but again, birds eat. But uh, birds eat, particularly the red bros, eat in a um, you know they're not kind of the chronic eaters that commercial broilers are. So certainly there would be a periodicity of feeding. For instance, when the sun comes up in the morning, um, all birds will go to the feeders. And so certainly fewer birds, there wouldn't be as much competition, for instance, early in the morning and late in the afternoon. And so that could have had an effect on feed intake, per se. Um, OK. Um, are there any f other feedstuffs um, that look promising to provide 
adequate levels of methionine to poultry? And how do you feel about um, adding um, organic alfalfa as a supplement for methionine? Well, um, alfalfa has a, a a certain level of methionine. Certainly, I, I have no. I mean, alfalfa for years um, before there was organic farming as we presently know it today. Uh, alfalfa has been a long-standing ingredient in, in poultry diets. Mostly, it was fed for its uh, its pigmentation value, you know, to enhance the, uh, the yellow color of the yolks. Um, I have no problem. I think alfalfa is a very, very good ingredient as long as it's ground uh, finely enough that you know it's not large particle size. Um, but the question with alfalfa is because of its fiber content, you know, how much can birds actually consume of it when you put it in the diet? Um, I think that was part of the question. What was the other part of the question, Alice? Um, well, can you whether you can recommend any other? Um other, any other feeds that would provide um, methionine? Well, I, I think that I think the part of it here is is getting into the age of the bird. Um, certainly, for very very young birds, where where feed consumption is not that high, you have to have a much higher level of protein in the diet to make up for the low level of feed intake. Um, this is one of the reasons why conventionally we use such high levels of soybean meal, um, you know, because it's, it's readily available and, and it's high in protein. We used to use a lot of rendered meat, meat products in conventional production. Um, any, any, any high protein ingredient, I don't have any, any alternatives per se. The problem is, as I've said a couple of times, it's getting it's having availability of it, um, you know. And so, if I find some variety of, of of high methionine X ingredient, the question is simply measuring the level of methionine and having it be twice as high as other cereal grains. How widespread or how available is that ingredient? And so, I think here we have to look at the realistic availability part of the equation. If a lot of people are going to adapt to practice versus uh, an experiment done in one laboratory with a small quantity of an ingredient that really does not apply to the real world, whether it's a conventional world or the organic world. Um, the other thing I want to get back to for a minute in talking about methionine is someone asked me about, you know, would this same, would this same practice work with, with laying hens? Um, and I think as I said, the real issue with laying hens, again, I'm talking here mostly about large-scale organic producers, egg producers, um, and I realize that kind of gets to the whole question of large-scale versus smaller organic producers, but the big issue is the fact that laying hens from the time they lay their first egg, so 19 or 20 weeks or about 25 or 26 weeks of age, the birds don't really consume enough feed to where intake can make up for, say, a low methionine diet, if that, if that makes sense to who's asking the question. Mm -hmm. Once birds are 25 or 26 weeks old and they're up to consuming about a quarter of a pound per bird per day or 25 pounds per 100 birds per day, that's where the intake gives us a lot of flexibility on level of methionine because of the fact that the birds are consuming enough feed from a diet that might be lower in methionine. But the real crux appears to be that first six or seven weeks in production when um, the birds are just coming in and we have a very, very difficult time getting adequate methionine intake, again, with our conventional ingredients um, with no supplemental methionine. That's not, a, that's not an exact answer. There's a lot of holes in my answer. I understand that. But that touches on a couple of the conundrums that people are facing. Okay, well, we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask one more question that I've got from several people um, about, you know, whether, um, where people might be able to see all the data or whether there's a published, um, if, there, if you're going to publish anything somewhere that would have all this data for people to read. Um, yeah, we will be publishing it. Um, next August is when the the grant is officially over, and I will have to write a comprehensive summary on it. 
Um, I did not have our email addresses on the introductory slide, and I apologize for that. But Alice, you have my email, and if, and if you want to pass that to anyone, anyone wants to contact me by email, I would be happy to send them all the information we have that's in presentation form for them to use or to see. Okay, and you'll get my email, kind of a follow-up email after this that you'll get automatically from GoToWebinar. So if anybody wants to contact me about how to get in touch with Mike, um, you could also look on, I'm sure if you just Googled his name, you'd find his um, website and most likely also the contact information yeah. there. Mike Lover at Ohio State University, and my email will show up. And I'd be happy to send anybody all the information we have in a summarized form that I've used for any number of presentations. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. And you can find all of our past webinars there, as well as many upcoming webinars this season um, at that first link on your screen. And if you have general questions about organic farming that aren't specifically about this project, you're always welcome to use the um, e-extension Ask an Expert service. And I've had the link up there now. So I'd like to thank you so much, Mike and Larry, for um, presenting your work today. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Yeah, thanks everyone and thanks for the great questions. Thank you, Alice, and thanks for thanks to all of the attendees. I appreciate it very much.